like. My name is Brad Johnson, and I'm the editor of Hill Heat, and I'm joined by uh, Jordan Haitler, who is my frequent collaborator and co-author, and is also a climate advisor and strategist with groups like Climate Cabinet. And we had planned this uh, little debrief of um, looking at the, especially the down ballot um, cons outcomes of the election, but uh, the reality is, is that the number one thing that will be shaping uh, the climate consequences will be the presidential. And uh, Trump is now in control. There's no silver lining to this. Uh, it's a victory for lifeboat ethics and ecofascism. And just briefly, uh, what I mean by lifeboat ethics is... Uh, Brad, sorry to interrupt. Noel, could could Noel mute, please? Yeah. Thank um, you. There we go. Okay, thank you. And uh, by lifeboat ethics, what I'm referring to is this was a term come up with the by the white supremacist economist uh, Garrett Hardin in the 1970s to describe what is his preferred. Uh, response to global e environmental catastrophe, which uh, he proposed was to uh, let rich nations uh, be the ones who survive and everyone else uh, does not get onto the lifeboat. And that philosophy has b been uh, pretty much fully endorsed and espoused by uh, Trump and now J.D. Vance and uh, that's what we are now going to see put in place as the explicit policy of the United States government to the degree that uh, they can. And so consequences of that include, uh, first and foremost, probably most immediately, uh, the systematic attempts to deport and demonize uh, immigrants or people who look like immigrants or other minority classes uh, that have been demonized by Trump on the campaign trail. Uh, we're also going to see uh, a planned evisceration of the regulatory state through uh, any number of policies, both through changes in policy, but also in terms of uh, getting rid of many, many members, uh, employees of the federal government. And that there's also going to be and in within that there will be a decimation of climate financial regulatory actions which is something that is uh of particular focus of jordan's and we can talk more about that in q a and we can talk about any of these in the q a but i want to move quickly we can expect locked in control of the courts it's expected that two members of the supreme court will retire and will be replaced by uh, Trump appointees. Uh, they're on specifically on kind of what we should with <laughs> energy policy. Uh, we can expect to see continued expansions of LNG exports. Hey, Joseph, uh, did you call? Let me. Jeff, could you mute, mute please? Yeah. Oh. There we go. There we've, sorry. Um, expansion of LNG imports, sorry. domestic mining. Uh, uh, and like a, an expansion of fossil fuel data centers and potentially also uh, renewable energy fuel data centers. But we should expect those that to be uh, done under a kind of a anti-regulatory process. Um, and we should also expect uh, a kind of a racist, militarized, incompetent, conspiracy fueled response to climate disasters. Uh, and you can kind of think about what we saw with the response to Helene and Milton, but Helene in particular, where you had uh, conspiracy theories being pushed by uh, the Trump campaign and promoted on platforms like Elon Musk's x.com. But we had the federal government and state governments uh, pushing out fact checks and real information of that. And now that is going to be changed in the other direction. Uh, one thing that I think is 
uh, just looking briefly at the, the what happened in the election, one thing I think that is striking is first year, first time voters uh, move very strongly to Trump. Uh, they were very much kind of, this was a vote against the incumbent and the incumbent party um, more than anything else, um, especially among voters who didn't remember uh, or, you know, weren't participating in the the Trump years as Paul, as uh, as voters. And one thing on that is I genuinely think that the economy is bad and uh, voters who thought that the economy is bad voted overwhelmingly for overwhelmingly for Trump. And uh, if you look at right here, this is the 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 fundamentals of our the economy are have are and have been bad for a very long time. This is a kind of one measure of economic inequality, and it's been at record highs for the last thirty years. Um, and if we look at say this is the billion dollar disaster events, and note that the number the values here are uh, corrected for inflation and they're going up and up and up. And these numbers don't include uh, uh, Helene's, I don't think they have all of Helene's numbers in here, Helene and Milton's numbers in here um, yet. And, and and so that's kind of uh, what we should recognize is that the um, people aren't necessarily People were voting against the system. They they've been voting against the system for a long time. They voted against Trump when he was incumbent. They voted against uh, you know Democrats when they were incumbent. So they've been voting against the uh, incumbent party for a good while, and now we have a Republican party that has an answer mm -hmm. to these questions uh, in Thanks to him. in uh, this kind of this fascism and. It's not clear to me yet whether the left has a coherent response. So that's my gloomy take. And now I'm going to shift it to Jordan, who's going to talk about some of the bright spots. Thanks, Brad. <laughs> um, well, so I will say my high level theory about what to do with many of these conditions that Brad laid out is that we need to rebuild so many of our civic institutions, including state and local governments, which can serve as vehicles for both climate and small d democratic resilience. And on that front, uh, there were, in fact, some bright spots uh, on uh, Tuesday. Um, so, uh, Brad, I think the um, yeah. screen lost. You see that? Yes. Uh, so there were um, some encouraging outcomes uh, looking down the ballot. Um, and I think it's in, in, uh, in general important to note that uh, looking down the ballot, you see a mixture of both encouraging and pretty confusing outcomes. Uh, key example is that the um, North Carolina, uh, Josh Stein, uh, won the governor's race fairly comfortably, even as uh, Trump was carrying the state uh, by a wider margin than we had hoped. And um, and there are many, many, many examples of that looking down the ballot. Um, just this morning, it was uh, announced that uh, the Pennsylvania uh, House was clinched. Uh, the Democrats maintained their one seat majority in the state house, um, which is uh, an unexpected outcome given that Trump carried Pennsylvania uh, in on the one hand. Um, but given everything that Brad described about, uh, you know, the, the new voters uh, that that swung uh, hugely to Trump and many low propensity voters, um, turning out for Trump, 
uh, you know, it'll be months before we have a rigorous analysis of this, but the the seat that was called for the Democrats um, this morning that clinched, clinched the, the majority uh, was a, a seat, a special uh, a, a legislative district that Trump carried by 35 points. Um, and so there are some baffling uh, things that need to be unpacked uh, when you look down down the ballot, um, and it's not as simple as the sort of polarization and, and partisanship that we've come to expect. Um, but uh, even in in difficult uh, environments and and swing states, there were some uh, very good pieces of news in in the second largest city in Michigan, Grand Rapids. Uh, very progressive climate hawk, uh, Dave Legrand was elected uh, and he has a, a progressive uh, city council joining him. Um, Lindsey Prather won a seat in North Carolina that was devastated by Hurricane Helene. And that was part of a um, house uh, breaking of the supermajority in the North Carolina State House, which will enable the newly elected governor, Josh Stein to veto uh, far right extremist bills that the North Carolina legislature has been um, enacting for a decade now, in some cases over the vetoes of uh, Roy Cooper, who's the outgoing. I Democrat. need to go to work. I don't know where dad is. Um, and then we have uh, uh, Michigan and uh, uh, Pennsylvania, where the Democrats still control the governorship. And as I mentioned, um, seem to have held the state house, uh, and in New Mexico, um, there have been actually, uh, a, a, a not super well-known story of, uh, progressive primary wins in 2018, in 2020, in 2022, and now in 2024. And although, uh, the makeup of the New Mexico legislature didn't change, the Democrats maintained the same large majorities that they had in both chambers, uh, that that those majorities are substantially uh, more uh, inclined for climate action uh, because of many results that occurred in June primaries. Um, moving on. Oops. Well, we I mean, we should, uh, you know, going going back to <laughs> grimmer news, um, there was you know, Democrats lost control of the U.S. Senate. Um, there was a significant outperformance uh, basically across the board. Um, I think John Tester uh, outperformed Kamala Harris by 13 points, uh, mm -hmm. even even in losing uh, the Senate seat in Montana. Uh, Sherrod Brown also lost, um, but uh, outperformed uh uh, Kamala Harris by, uh, I think, seven points as last last I checked. Um, Tammy Baldwin managed to win in Wisconsin, uh, and uh, and it, and and it, at, at the moment, um, Jackie Rosen leads in Nevada, and Ruben Gallego leads in Arizona. Um, and uh, in the House, uh, it's still not called. Uh, but uh, Democrats would have to sweep the remaining uncalled races to win a narrow majority. So it, it seems unlikely, uh, but there are um, there is a possibility of of uh, uh, a large minority for the Democrats in the House. Um, but I do want to say, most of you probably knew all of that already. Um, there, th I do want to talk a little bit about the climate. Um, and larger prospects for the upcoming uh, lame duck session uh, that in what remains of, of this session of Congress, um, there will be a supplemental package uh, to provide federal relief to um, respond to the disasters of Helene and Milton. Um, and then uh, there is going to be um, a pretty uh, bleak uh, agenda, a largely corporate agenda uh, that will be uh, adopted in all likelihood on a bipartisan basis uh, with uh, Democrats still in control of the Senate for a few more weeks. Um, I'll let 
Brad maybe share more about Mansion Barrasso, but I'll speak to um, Fit 21, which is a bill uh, that passed the House with uh, more than 70 House Democrats joining Republicans in support earlier this year. And it is a bill that essentially uh, deregulates cryptocurrency and hands enforcement authority over from the SEC to the much weaker and under-resourced CFTC. Uh, and it and as 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 of a few months ago, Chuck Schumer was indicating that he wanted to pass it in the lame duck session. Uh, and despite the fact that John Tester and uh, Sherrod Brown uh, faced a barrage of crypto money that was a factor in both of their losses uh, and that caused Chuck Schumer to lose his Senate majority. Um, you know, my my bet would be that he follows through on that promise in what remains of this Congress. Um, there have there has been a farm bill that has moved out of the House uh, with um, li pretty limited Democratic support. Um, uh, but some Democratic support. And uh, it was a very bad bill drafted by the House Agriculture Republicans. Uh, it got regenerative ag funding. And uh, Debbie Stabenow, the outgoing Senate Agriculture Chair, had indicated that she was not planning on um, advancing that bill. Um, uh, now that Republicans have evidently uh, maintained uh, a or won a majority in both chambers, uh, there probably won't be action on the farm bill in the remainder of this year. And instead, we can expect that the the, the floor, uh, if you will, uh, will be the bill that House Republicans drafted uh, and that they will try to pass a farm bill next year that uh, guts regenerative ag funding some of which was in the, much of which was in the IRA. Uh, Brad, do you want to talk about Mansion Barassa? I, I won't do as good a job as Jordan, but the Mansion Barrasso is, that's uh, the outgoing West Virginia, now independent Senator uh, Joe Manchin and uh, John Barrasso's uh, quote unquote bipartisan uh, permit reform legislation. And the, it's, I mean, it's a pretty straightforward uh, gutting of the National Environmental Policy Act and uh, would, uh, it's when, when I was talking about the kind of the uh, policies of increased uh, LNG and uh, kind of fracking pipelines and uh, infrastructure and increased domestic mining, uh, those are the types of things that we could expect out of that. Uh, there's some... Uh, there's been some, uh, kind of center left, uh, support, uh, in the idea that, uh, and all of the above, no red tape policy for, uh, would be good for, uh, renewable energy. But one thing that we've seen, for example, is that, uh, like even when the federal government, uh, tries to push forward new transmission uh, lines or offshore wind that the uh, states and localities are are able to block it. Now, you know, I think some of the argument uh, that's been made for uh, a kind of a burn everything down policy like Mansion Barrasso is that uh, this would, uh, by giving more power to the federal government, we would uh, be able to steamroll local and uh, state officials. But that's not really uh, that helpful if the federal government is run by Donald Trump. So I'll leave, I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, but it's not clear, again, what the prospects for this are. And uh, that like the last bullet point there of judicial appointments, a lot of it really kind of depends on what the uh, Biden and Schumer decide on having their be the the lame duck agenda and whether they decide to kind of uh tack right or to uh like as senators like elizabeth warren have asked for to use this remaining time to try to 
build some bulwarks yeah. for democracy. Yes. So uh, going forward, uh, let's talk. We uh, Jordan talked a bit about uh, the state legislatures and uh, kind of just briefly, uh, the there were eleven gubernatorial elections and there were no changes uh, in the party, which was actually uh, quite unusual. And uh, Republicans uh, currently are going into twenty twenty five with 18 trifectas and Democrats are going in with 11 and there's still uh, several chambers that uh, have been uncalled uh, previous to this morning. There were 12, but uh, Democrats uh, maintain control of the Pennsylvania House. And uh, here we have a kind of a, a real, a, a lot of detail here and if we go quickly over and Jordan should feel free to break in with any um, uh, notes, but we can also talk more about any of these in Q and A if you'd like. Uh, Arizona, the election, the results aren't in yet, uh, but Democrats may have broken the Republican majority in the House. Uh, Jordan talked about uh, the good news coming out of New Mexico, uh, Pennsylvania. Also, the, we've talked about the good news and. Uh, Jordan and the good news in uh, North Carolina. Uh, we also have, uh, you know, a mix, but basically good news in Wisconsin, especially given uh, how uh, rough things were at the top of the ticket. Um, in Michigan, <laughs> Democrats lost control of the House, but uh, they still have the Senate majority. Uh, unfortunately, Montana Republican, oh no, fortunately, Montana Republicans lost their supermajority, but that's still uh, a, a very Republican state. Uh, and Minnesota, Democrats won their special election to maintain control of the Senate. And uh, as we say, there's a 13 vote lead uh, in a House seat, which could determine whether the House will remain tied. So, but Democrats did lose their uh, their trifecta, but we there's the, the kind of like the Minnesota miracle is not all the way over. Uh, Republicans, one of the few places that Republicans made significant gain was in South Carolina, though. Uh, going on to, I think, what is real, uh, you know, powerful news is the ballot measures across the country that were overwhelmingly successful uh, in addition to the uh, big successes that we saw on most abortion uh, rights measures and also on uh, policies like raising the minimum wage and protecting health insurance and other worker protections, we saw really big uh, wins for climate resilience votes, like huge investments, uh, it's, uh, starting with California's $10 billion Proposition 4 for climate resilience efforts passed easily. We also saw bond and tax measures for funding climate resilience, environmental protection, and infrastructure across the country uh, from Maine and Minnesota and Rhode Island. Uh, Honolulu passed its explicitly named Climate Resilience Fund. And we also saw uh, voters, like um, usually passing by quite wide margins, uh, tax and bond measures for uh, you know parks and uh, transportation and like especially like public transit and you know sewer and stormwater and flood control infrastructure in uh, cities uh, across the country. There you know they, there wasn't any uh, particular trend or anything other than that these almost that they pretty much all won. Uh, when we go to places where there was was some con real contestation, Washington State, uh, a, you know, kind of multimillionaire put uh, together a suite of uh, anti-climate uh, initiatives. The initiative to overturn the state's climate law was overwhelmingly rejected, but the one to protect uh, you know, fracked gas against regulations uh, is currently winning, but it has not yet been called. And similarly, Berkeley, whose attempt to ban uh, natural gas uh, had been struck down, uh, 
the supporters, climate activists put together measure GG, which would have taxed natural gas hookups in commercial buildings, but supporters were wildly outspent by uh, the real estate and business lobby and uh, that that measure went down. Um, and that's really all we have in terms of just like our, our first look. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about what people can do right now. Uh, we've talked about some of these very close elections and there's a lot of elections that haven't been called yet. Uh, votes are still very much coming in, especially from the West Coast, like California, Arizona and Nevada. And uh, they they're, efforts that are needed right now for ballot curing, which is the process of voters who have submitted ballots, but are uh, they're not being counted for one technical reason or other, and they still have an opportunity to fix that ballot if they take action. And so there are phone banks, and we can tell you more about that. Uh, it can put some links in the, the chat if you'd like uh, about how you can uh, phone bank people just to make sure that their vote is counted. Um, there's a big coalition effort for mobilizing and organizing uh, that's at We Are Worth Fighting For uh, that's uh, run by people with the Working Families Party and many other groups. Uh, and it's uh, organizations that have frankly been uh, preparing for uh, this, this moment in our politics for a long time. And so we're actually ready to go with the kind of solidarity work and organizing uh, that we need to uh, protect and defend uh, civil society and democracy and our, our fellow Americans. Uh, one nice thing I want to mention is if you're in Washington, DC, there's a, a happy hour tonight that's with the Green Do New Deal Network and a bunch of other progressive networks that's uh, this evening at Busboy and Poets uh, 450K location. and. I'll, I'm hoping to go there. And I also hope that you subscribe. Uh, we tell your friends to subscribe to uh, hillheat.news. Uh, those are our emails. You can reach me at brad at hillheat.com and jordan at climatecabinet.org. And now I'm going to open up to questions. If you can, uh, you can put questions in chat or we can also, uh, you can also raise hand. I'm going to stop the screen sharing and we'll go back to this. Uh, yeah, I want to note that if you check the chat, uh, the great Adam Servana, don't, don't worry about hijacking, has uh, added a link to resources from the Union of Concerned Scientists on Mansion Barrasso and 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 some other groups and uh that's a, a really good resource for uh mobilizing on that and it's it's that's certainly something that uh members of congress need to be aware that this is uh pass passage of these kind of that the lame duck needs to be not a uh an accelerated uh adoption of the the trump regime <laughs> which I can tell you as someone who lives in DC, there's uh, a tremendous, uh, remarkable bias towards uh, doing doing that, uh, that is somewhat uncanny sometimes. Uh, but if, if anybody has questions, feel free to raise your hand and also I'll turn it over to Jordan for remarks. Or if Jordan has anything to say. I have some remarks, but I'll, I'll incorporate them into answering questions first. Well, oh, good. We got something from Doyle. Let me, uh, all right. Uh, Doyle, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, thanks so much for putting this together. It was really helpful to sort of collect our thoughts and start to think about what's next. Um, I'm advising clients in California and Oregon, and Gavin Newsom yesterday announced a special session in California to sort of, you know, prepare for the change of the federal government. I'm wondering if anyone has any suggestions on how climate groups should be approaching that, and if that also happens in other blue trifecta states, like, do we have a play we want to make? Yeah, well, um, I have some ideas there. Uh, as I mentioned 
before. Uh, I strongly believe that state governments can be uh, powerful vehicles for climate and democratic resilience in this moment. Um, and uh, one issue that I've been working on uh, the most over the past few years has been uh, insurance, uh, since that is a key channel for spreading climate risk through the financial system, and it's entirely regulated at the state level. And there have been some uh, actions uh, by uh, uh, by various uh, federal and state actors uh, over the past years as uh, the climate crisis has uh, caused uh, so much disruption and so much uh, harm in, in insurance markets and, and made the, the price of housing so much more uh, unaffordable. Um, and uh, the Biden administration uh, can't do much uh, on insurance policy, but they did put out uh, a sit, set of um, regulatory recommendations for integrating climate into the insurance supervision uh, regime that occurs at the state level. Um, and there are states like California, like Minnesota, that have been doing really good things uh, to strengthen climate resilience, investing in uh, the sort of hazard mitigation and uh, smart climate resilient protective measures that need to happen to uh, bolster community resilience against growing floods and wildfires. Um, and so more investment of that and harmonizing uh, those investments with uh, the insurance regulatory regime is something that uh, California has taken some action on, although Gavin Newsom has and the insurance commissioner in California, Ricardo Lara, have also been bad in some areas that I will detail offline if, if you want to reach out to me. Um, but there were some uh, positive results uh, on Tuesday. Um, only 11 states elect insurance commissioners, but Washington state is one of them. And a, a very uh, strong uh, climate champion uh, named Patty Kuderer was elected as Washington's insurance commissioner. Um, so in Oregon, Washington, and California, where uh, all along the the West Coast, uh, where wildfires are are causing these major challenges with both housing and uh, consumer hazards, um, there's strong potential to. Uh, to adopt uh, the recommendations that that the Biden administration made and uh, invest in uh, affordable housing as, uh, along the lines of some of the things that that Kamala Harris outlined in her campaign and 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 even more ambitious uh, where possible and dem trifecta states are examples of where it is possible. Brad, do you want to add any further thoughts? I I. I, I don't have anything, uh, you know, useful or insightful uh, for that, uh, other than it's something that it's like uh, very worth people, uh, you know, kind of getting involved with. Uh, I, I just want to mention that I've shared a few links to several different uh, ballot curing uh, events in the, the chat uh, for anybody who's looking for one extra thing to do uh, this weekend. And they like if you follow the links, there's a lot of these have uh, uh, things for this afternoon. Uh, are there any other questions that people have? Uh, one thing I or I should say one thing I, I noticed we didn't talk about kind of what this means specifically for international uh, policy. And uh, one thing that we can expect is that, it, you know, the internationally in terms of it, it's we're, that's something that will probably look the most like what we saw during the the first Trump term, where I mean, but though who really knows? But where if the U.S. again pulls out of the Paris Agreement, then that means that at the the climate talks they will only have observer status, um, and again it will be uh, the municipal and like. Uh, the state level uh, contingents that will be engaging with uh, the talks uh, directly. And so again, 
it's things like the the policy in Washington State that really matter. Uh, it very much opened the air up in the air whether there will be a, a similar business coalition that we saw the last time with the kind of like the we mean business coalition. And it, I'd say that the kind of like the early indications are that um, you know at least a, a, a lot of business business leaders that did not jump on the Trump bandwagon immediately or even actively oppose the Trump administration have uh, changed uh, their positions quite aggressively uh, already to uh, embrace uh, Trump as president. And so, uh, and we've also seen uh, the kind of the backlash, uh, the systematic uh, attacks on uh, kind of uh, climate in smart investing and uh, business practices. So uh, that I'm not optimistic about, but it's certainly something that will uh, continue to need to be fought. I also just want to thank all the people who are out here on the call, like uh, Annie Leonard with uh, uh, the Jane Fonda Climate Pack. One thing I didn't explicitly give a shout out as much is for the organizations that uh, back so many of these down ballot candidates and uh, and in many cases are responsible for uh, helping them win. The the ones that I, I've been very impressed by, kind of somewhat on the outside and somewhat as an ally, is uh, there's Climate Cabinet, which uh, Jordan advises with, uh, the Jane Fonda Climate Pack, uh, Climate Hawks Vote, uh, and this, and lead locally, especially, and the they've uh, done a really impressive job of working both in primaries and in the general election to to support candidates who are climate champions, both who are you know progressive leaders and are wielding power at the state and local level, uh, and also ones that are in uh, swing districts and and you know making the difference in. Uh, whether or not, uh, like climate, ad, you know, climate people have uh, actually have the power to to do anything, and there's some, you know, again, there's a lot of positive work in uh, any number of cities. Like it's not just in Grand Rapids, Michigan, but across the country. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, there was a real uh, concerted effort to. Uh, improve to get some climate champs onto the Arizona Corporation Commission, which uh, oversees Arizona's public utilities. But that does look like uh, the kind of the anti-climate Republicans did uh, win there. And uh, I want to give again, I don't want to wait, take too much more people's time. If people have more questions, I really love to uh, we love to take them now. And otherwise, we can uh, wrap up pretty quickly in about two minutes. Oh, yeah. And I guess this is one thing that it's like um, worth mentioning is that and this was something that was uh, reminded it by the climate cabinets debrief, which is that this wasn't really a, uh, this wasn't particularly a climate election. Uh, the, uh, or certainly like the democratic party at the top of the ticket, like it was not, uh, they, they weren't running on it. It wasn't something that like was top of mind for voters, um, at least explicitly as climate though I think it's a mistake to try to divorce uh again that's why I'm going back to the kind of the lifeboat ethics uh and eco-fascist framing is is a, a real mistake to divorce these kind of questions about the economy and people's economic well-being and people's feelings about immigration um uh, and from uh from climate policy because that's what the, that is what climate policy is, is the, the destruction of our climate means that um, the 
you know, underpinnings of our economy are uh, increasingly at risk and are being damaged. And, you know, and that's why I was saying like the salience of home insurance hasn't quite translated to uh, kind of big campaigns. But one part, one thing, reason is that because that's not something that the uh, kind of like funding community has invested in like communicating uh, that, though it's certainly something that uh, voters actually care a lot about and are very upset by. Um, one thing that we actually saw is it looks like the uh, the the counties that were most directly affected by Helene and saw a strong, you know, federal response actually bucked the tide of the rest of the country where there was a pretty massive shift towards uh, Republicans and towards Trump in particular uh, from four years ago. In in those counties, we actually saw Harris uh, improve their vote against uh, Biden. And uh, I think we really need to, it, I personally, the one thing I would like, would personally love to see is I'd love to see uh, candidates who are actually running on the climate crisis being a real and immediate danger to people. And, uh, and that is why we need to take serious action against the fossil fuel industry. Uh, we have a great question from Thomas Crookham. I'm going to read it and, and then I'm going to uh, have Jordan answer it. <laughs> uh, Thomas asks, in this political environment, what policies can we promote that are aligned with the prevailing interests? Utilities are largely incentivized to build large centralized infrastructure because they can get a guaranteed rate of return from the ratepayers. What can we do to incentivize utilities to promote distributed energy resources? It's a great question. Uh, you know, I would say one answer lies in in the implementation of uh, the IRA, which uh, is is still law, um, and although it faces many threats uh, and will um, almost certainly be um, undermined and, and pared down in some ways. There are resources and programs and funding that has gone out the door. The $27 billion greenhouse gas reduction fund has already been obligated. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's unclear if there's all that much that a Trump administration can do to stop the tier one greenhouse gas reduction fund recipients from supporting uh, green banks uh, and state uh, and governmental and nonprofit structures that have been doing a ton to uh, do exactly what you said, distributed um, energy generation, solar rooftop, uh, not just for homes, but on schools and other public uh, institutions. And um, there is going to be, before the Biden administration ends, a big uh, um, IRS uh, finalization of a uh, complicated uh, issue that I'll put more information about in the chat. Um, but uh, essentially, it is a uh, rulemaking that we need the IRS to make that would unlock a ton more uh, public financing for uh, solar rooftop and and other uh, examples of everything that Thomas mentioned. Um, I, I I would also add um, that uh, although the Arizona Corporation Commission results were uh, very disappointing, that Brad uh, is absolutely correct that uh, nothing about this election is going to stop um, climate from becoming more and more of a pocketbook issue as utility rates go up as insurance uh, premiums continue to skyrocket um, and as climate disasters uh, intensify. And, um, and, and just as uh, we've all, you know, not only do we see um, ballot measures funding climate resilience pass um, with large margins uh, in uh, red, blue and purple states, but we also um, have seen states uh, take action into their own hands in the face of a dysfunctional federal government even before uh, this moment. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, last year, uh, 
it, you know, the government shut down negotiations, uh, bled into the end of September, just as um, hurricane season was, uh, you know, uh, upon us. And um, we saw uh, severe flooding in uh, one storm in Massachusetts. Uh, and Massachusetts was denied relief from FEMA, um, not because the uh, storm hadn't been damaging enough, but because uh, FEMA's disaster relief fund was underfunded. Uh, the same thing happened in Hawaii, where um, the Maui wildfires hit in September, um, as, just as Congress was, uh, you know, uh, fighting over uh, government shutdown negotiations, and the supplemental to provide relief to Maui wildfires didn't come until months later. Um, and what did the Hawaii government do? Well, the Hawaii governor issued an executive order that creates uh, a climate resilience uh, fund and lays out a framework. Uh, details are, are still not fully uh, you know, uh, available, but they are taking matters into their own hands in terms of um, investing in climate resilience that will um, sh uh, not only uh, you know, uh, assist, assist the people in communities in need, but um, but uh, help uh, housing and insurance markets going forward. Um, and so, I, I expect that to continue and to to proliferate and and escalate. Um, and then, yes, finally, last note, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't say that you know, Climate Cabinet and and many other organizations that I work with have um, been seizing on this insight for a long time and are really interested in getting more investment in insurance commissioner elections, in treasurer elections, in utility commissioner elections, and some of these elections where climate is becoming a pocketbook issue and we haven't really recognized that as a, as a movement uh, and, and now we have to. And I think that's a good place to end it up. I want to thank everybody for uh, joining us today. And uh, I I hope we can do this again in with more victories and uh, brighter news in the future. Thank you so much.